They assembled groups of individuals in key battleground states and got them to call themselves electors, created phony certificates associated with these fake electors, and then transmitted these certificates to Washington and to the Congress to be counted during the joint session of Congress on January 6th. None of this worked. But according to Federal District Judge David Carter, former President Trump and others likely violated multiple federal laws by engaging in this scheme, including conspiracy to defraud the United States. Hi again, everyone. It is 5 o'clock in Washington, D.C., and I'm Simone Sanders Townsend, in for Nicole Wallace. The fake elector scheme was an illegal attempt for Donald Trump to cling to power, an effort across seven states to give then-Vice President Mike Pence an alternate, incorrect slate of electors to certify on January 6th. Now, former Vice President Pence ultimately did not interfere in the Electoral College certification, but from the work of the 1-6 Select Committee and various other reporting, we know how deep this plan went. Now, a new report by CNN reveals even more about how far these Trump allies went in their pursuit of this scheme. NBC News has not matched the reporting. It finds that when there was concern that the fake elector certificates from two critical battleground states were stuck in the mail on their way to the Capitol, quote, Trump campaign operatives scrambled to fly copies of the phony certificates from Michigan and Wisconsin to the nation's Capitol, relying on a haphazard chain of couriers as well as help from two Republicans in Congress to try to get the documents to then-Vice President Mike Pence while he presided over the Electoral College certification. These details come mostly from the architect of the fake elector plot himself, Kenneth Chesbro, who pleaded guilty in October to a felony conspiracy charge in Georgia and has also met with prosecutors in Michigan, Nevada, and Wisconsin who are investigating the fake electors in their own states. Here is Chesbro describing the prosecutors in Michigan, the panic among Trump campaign staffers just days before the 6th. Oh, he was checking the, the tracking. These tracking? are, these, okay. yeah, the tracking. Okay. And, and the thing is, what's even more alarming is the whole point of the archive is getting two, is that one is reserved for the president's Senate in case there's a problem with the mail. And it hadn't gotten to the archivist either. So the, the logical backup was not available. So, yeah, so the... The general counsel campaign was alarmed and and was chartering. Uh, well, they didn't have to charter a jet, but they did commercial. I mean, no, so that says then the email. The I forget. I forget. Them. I forget if they chartered. But that's you know this is like yeah. So this is a high level decision yeah. to get the Michigan and and Wisconsin votes there. To and they they had to enlist a uh, the, you know a, a U.S. senator to to try to expedite it to get it uh, get it to. Uh, uh, pants in time. The senator he's referring to, Republican Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, who, when asked for comment by CNN, reiterated his previous comments, which said, my involvement in that attempt to deliver spanned the course of a couple seconds, and that, in the end, those electors were not delivered. This new reporting providing a window into the last-ditch anti-democratic attempts by Trump allies to keep the former president in power despite his election defeat ones that special counsel Jack Smith emphasizes in his indictment where he charged Trump with conspiracy to defraud the country and obstruct the peaceful transfer of power. And that is where we start this hour with former congressman from Florida, MSNBC, political analyst David Jolly, former federal prosecutor and NBC, NBC News legal analyst Paul Butler, say that five times, Paul, and former <laughs> FBI counterintelligence agent Peter Strzok and also the president of the National Action Network and host of Politics Nation here on MSNBC, the great Reverend Al Sharpton. David, talk about the links. I mean, this, this reporting yeah. from CNN is just yeah. stunning. The links that the Trump campaign went to, the Trump allies, in order to have these fake elector certificates at the Capitol on January 6th. Yeah, Simone, first, you know, something that I don't think we've ever really focused on, how dirty is Ron Johnson in all of this, right? I mean, he does all these interviews. He kind of plays up his whole, I was protecting the election integrity, but he was very much involved in this. I mean, Ron Johnson kind of sitting in the U.S. Senate as one of the chief conspirators is something that I think we often overlook. But I also think all of this information, from the phone calls that were made to the election canvassers in Michigan, to this effort for how we shuttle a slate of alternate electors to the U.S. Senate, 
It all actually goes to defeat the fundamental claim and defense of Donald Trump. Okay. Recall Donald Trump's immunity claim, the one that he lost in the D.C. Circuit that, that Jack Smith wants heard in the Supreme Court and ultimately will be. It is that somehow Donald Trump was engaged in activities related to the outer perimeter of the presidency. That's not this. It is, you could picture a world in which the president is interested in fair and free elections, in the administration of fair elections. But in that case, a president would do what we saw kind of with Bush and Gore, though they weren't presidents. They would have their James Baker or their Warren Christopher ensuring that the proper administration of elections had happened. That's not this. This is the direct influence of a president trying to rig elections in Georgia and Michigan and Wisconsin and other states to get himself more votes. And I think all of this information, all of these details ultimately serve to defeat the fundamental defense of Donald Trump, which is somehow he was engaged in a presidential act and therefore immune. No, he wasn't. All of this information suggests it's not. It just, it's, it's just so undemocratic. Uh, Pete, we know that Kenneth Chesbro, that he is unindicted co-conspirator number five. Is there anything else that we know about potential cooperation by him with federal investigators? This testimony to Michigan legislators is, uh, pardon, to, to Michigan officials is just quite astonishing. Well, it's certainly interesting, Simone, and in given the detail that came out through these recordings, one of the very interesting things that was included in that reporting was a statement from, I think, Chesborough's attorneys saying that they had approached Jack Smith several months ago and offered to come in and speak to them and that they hadn't received a uh, response. Now, why that's interesting, for a couple of reasons. We know Chesborough, of course, has been charged in Fulton County, Georgia. There's been reporting that, as you indicated, he's spoken to folks in Nevada and Wisconsin and Michigan. So he isn't shying away from prosecutors. He isn't shying away from sitting down in proffer sessions and giving sworn testimony. But it is curious that Jack Smith, whose team, for instance, has given Rudy Giuliani, Giuliani a proffer session, has not yet pursued Chesbro. Now, on the one hand, that speaks to just the huge amount of alleged crime here, the vast complexity of just across state after state after state that Jack Smith has to look at. Now, it could be that investigators and prosecutors want to get as much information as they can before they take Chesbro up in his offer. But I would certainly expect that at some point they would take him up on that offer, even if it doesn't result on anything, simply to see and hear what it is he has to say. You know, Paul, this, this point that Pete is making, I, I think is really important because the fake electors plot is a very big part of Jack Smith's indictment. One, can you speak to why, but two, why do you think uh, Jack Smith and his team have yet to speak to the architect of the fake electors plot, Ken Chesbro? So, Ken Chesbro has some baggage. He's snitching now like a scorned man. He's mad because Trump's top campaign guys like Matt Morgan and Mike Roman have tried to distance themselves from the big lie. They claim that after the election, Rudy Giuliani and Kim Ken Chesbro were, were running everything. But Chesbro's like, he's like, well, if I'm going down, I'm taking everybody else with me. So that's why we're getting all these juicy details. But look, Simone, Jack Smith already knows all of this. He really needs this trial to happen before Election Day. Uh, that's why his federal election interference case focused on the person who was most culpable, former President Trump. That's why there's only one defendant and only four counts. But Chesbro is an unindicted co-conspirator in the federal election interference case. He could be charged later. That's why his attorneys are right now reaching out, trying to make a deal. Mm. You know, Reverend Sharpton, uh, I want you to listen to more of what Chesbro has to say. He's talking to prosecutors again in Michigan. He finds Representative Perry, whoever is Pennsylvania, and who gets a staffer to agree to meet us at like 3.45 p.m. And so, um, and I don't know why why we did, did that. So Mike Brown, you know, I, I had the Wisconsin stuff, Mike Brown had the Michigan stuff. We walked to the Longworth office building, and the guy with Perry, or whatever his name is, and some other fellow uh, that were like uh, staff members of the, uh, of the, uh, in the House, uh, took them and said, we're going to walk them over to 
the Senate and give it to a Senate staffer, or I guess it was a Senate staffer for Johnson. And so that's how, I don't know why logistically we didn't take it directly to Johnson, uh, but that's how we, we, we did it. Rev, how alarmed are you that it, at least one member of the House and one senator were also involved in this very illegal scheme? It is extremely alarming uh, because we're seeing people that actively try to undermine the due uh, decision uh, that was made by voters. I think it is also interesting that we see these reports come out as the Supreme Court now is having to deal with uh, what has happened in terms of Maine taking uh, Trump off the uh, ballot and, uh, and, and Colorado. So don't forget all these schemes were corresponding with January 6th to stop the certification. The more this comes out, I think the more the Supreme Court has to look at this was an active attempt to uh, create a false set of electors to undermine and in many ways, therefore, uh, deny the American public of a uh, an election, a due process election, which is an insurrection. How in the face of all of this, it becomes more and more difficult for the Supreme Court to come back and say, uh, we don't know if there was an insurrection here in the 14th Amendment and uh, third section or fourth section doesn't apply. When there's an elaborate scheme that clearly went all the way up to Donald Trump, who led the January 6th march and rally and said, meet me over there. This was because that was all to be combined with what we're hearing now to stop Mike Pence from having the election or the certification on that day. This all comes together. We have to make sure we understand we're not talking about isolated incidents here.